Playing the finals almost every day has been a total blast, but even though we are halfway through season 1, the story hasn't progressed that much. Which is why I wanted to wait some time before discussing any new developments. I went back to the sponsors, the maps, the voice lines, the cosmetics, and even the easter egg hunt, and found some interesting connections that changed how I perceived the story. So, grab your cafecito and let's theorize about a darker side of the final slope. In case you don't remember or you're just finding out, the storyline is vague and mysterious. It draws inspiration from in-real-life events, cities, and characters to create its narrative. It takes place roughly 75 years in the future, around the year 2100. And in this setting, everyone spends a lot of time in the virtual world instead of the real one. People connect through VR technology to play the finals, the greatest game show in the world. Here, contestants battle their way for fame, fortune, and the favor of sponsors. At first glance, it doesn't seem like the story is that deep. But in order to dive into the depths of the finals lore, we first need to understand how the developers tell this story. Since the early stages of the game, Embark has been using three main narrative vehicles to tell the story at different levels of complexity. The in-game sponsors, the maps, and the cosmetics. Sponsors are the outer layer and the easiest way to understand the story. They have logos, slogans, CEOs, and descriptions about what they represent in the finals world. We see them in trailers, loading screens, maps, cosmetics, they're everywhere. Maps are an intermediate piece of the puzzle as they feature other brands, hidden messages, and lore-related voice lines from the commentators. We spend a lot of time playing in these virtual arenas and every now and then we might spot some of the lore details. And lastly, cosmetics which are the inner layer and the most difficult part to understand, as they don't necessarily offer clear connections to the overall story. Now, I will also consider adding a core layer that is even more cryptic, the easter egg hunt. I do consider it to be the deepest form of the finals narrative. It's led by Embark's co-founder and CCO Rob Brunson, who is the mastermind behind the finals lore. And it's a way for Embark to engage with the community and provide an extra layer of the story through complex puzzles and riddles. This is where everything is connected, where there are no coincidences. And I believe the relationship and combination between these narrative vehicles provides a very enigmatic and mysterious playground where we can unravel different story threads. So, let me walk you through some of my theories. From season 0 to season 1, we've been introduced to a plethora of brands and sponsors in the finals world that represent diverse products and services. Energy drinks, clothing lines, tech developers, digital manufacturers, insurance companies, you name it. Alongside these sponsors came a variety of maps based on some of the world's most iconic locations that exemplify wealth and popularity. Monaco is the richest country in the world. Seoul is considered the leader in tech and innovation, and Las Vegas is the entertainment and gambling capital. And on top of that, we were given an abundance of cosmetics to build our contestants however we want, from body type and face to outfits and accessories. But when we put gameplay aside, the overarching themes suddenly feel like they revolve around hyper-capitalism. This refers to a relatively new form of capitalistic social organization, a system that causes imbalance and fragmentation of social life by allowing commercial or business interest to penetrate every aspect of human experience. In a way, the finals portrays a world where core functions have been privatized by a multitude of sponsors, while individuals are fully entitled to exercise their bodies and skills as the contestants. But these sponsors seem to manage their own operations while acting as different subsidiaries under a corporate umbrella that runs the finals. For instance, Discovery Corp is responsible for manufacturing digital weapons, Volpi is the creator of the VR tech that makes the finals possible, 
Holto is in charge of protecting virtual assets against damage or loss, and so on, all working under the same roof. Fun fact, the finals was internally called Project Discovery, and if you just discovered this channel and you're enjoying it, consider subscribing. Anyway, like I was saying, there might be a larger company that oversees the smaller subsidiaries. Although there hasn't been a clear indication of what it's called, my theory is that it might be related to the name Multico, as in multi-company or multi-corporation. This idea stems from two sources, the in-game currency called Multibox, and more importantly, the operating system made by Multico, displayed in the credits section of the game. When you access it, it prompts a window for an OS called MUCODOS that seems to have been developed in 1982. Hmm, do you remember what I said earlier? The finals draws inspiration from in real life events to create its narrative, which means that name and that year are no coincidences. In the tech world, DOS stands for Disk Operating System. It's a technology that provides a file system for organizing, reading, and writing files on the storage disk, and a means for loading and running programs. So in that sense, the name could purely stand for Multico Disk Operating System. Now, in regards to 1982, there's three things I'd like to point out. A, that was the year when we got introduced to the first home computer, the Commodore 64 or C64, which was known for creating superior visuals and audio compared to other systems. The reason I bring it up is because the Multico interface emulates the C64 startup screen. B. The original Tron and Blade Runner movies were released that year. Tron tells the story of a computer programmer and video game developer who is transported inside the software universe of a mainframe computer, where he interacts with programs in his attempt to escape. Blade Runner tells the story of a retired LAPD officer who is tasked with hunting down a group of illegal humanoid androids looking for their creator, except one of them proves to be different. Both movies are considered state-of-the-art examples of science fiction cinema, and they each portray the cyberpunk genre through several sites of technology, included but not limited to virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and genetic engineering. And C, the first known microcomputer virus that spread in the wild was also created in 1982, and it was called the Elk Cloner. It was written as a joke by a teenager, who attached the virus to a game and set it to release at a specific time. Instead of the computer playing the game, it would display the following poem. The virus didn't cause any harm as it was just a silly prank. But what's interesting to me is how similar it looks to the messages sent by CNS. To refresh your memory, CNS is an unknown individual, organization, or quite simply, a program that has occasionally hacked the finals broadcast and several official art images that relate to the Easter egg hunt. The main theory about the meaning of CNS was proposed by the Easter egg hunter, Fish, and it got confirmation from Rob. Central Nervous System It wasn't until recently that I actually pondered on what this could imply. Some of their previous messages included Seek the truth beyond the walls Don't trust them Taking back what is ours So it makes sense to think that someone is sending these call to actions But then I looked at the glowy bones bundle that appeared in the store which includes a cosmetic called Clever Chronometer The description says that vitals and activity of contestants are monitored in the arena And that got me thinking if the showrunners, or Multico, is tracking biometric data of contestants playing the game show, and CNS refers to the central nervous system, then whoever is sending these messages might be using some type of network virus that spreads in the VR world and is set off by specific CNS functions. You see, the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. It controls thought, movement, and emotion, as well as breathing, heart rate, hormones, and body temperature, all of which could play a critical role in establishing a link between the virtual world and the CNS, 
making both the VR device and the contestant suitable targets for hacking attempts given the right conditions. Curiously enough, there's also a somewhat loose theory that the energy drink made by Ospuse is actually used to induce contestants into deeper states of unconsciousness so they never leave the VR. The fact remains that whoever is behind CNS is trying to snap people back to their realities, to their lives, and to reclaim something they lost in the fragmented and alienated world of the finals. And I know what you're probably thinking, Spear, come on, it's not that sinister. But it can be, because this wouldn't be the only way a corporation like Multico takes advantage of the consumers, especially in a hyper-capitalist environment where there's minimal interference from the government. It's very clear that the more time people spend in VR, the better. Those watching the game show join remotely, and those competing plug into the simulation. The result is a cycle that adds more and more value to virtual activities and assets. On one hand, this brings me back to the virtual arenas and the importance of creating visually stimulating experiences for player and viewer retention. And it's no surprise that Multico has virtual architects creating the digital replicas for the arenas. Not only that, in the latest edition of Las Vegas, they deliberately followed many of the casino design principles in real life that aim to lure and trap guests into spending money, which in turn means keeping contestants and viewers within the finals VR with little to none contact to the real world, or the meat space. On the other hand, this obsession with investing time and money on a virtual persona comes with its own ramifications. So far, we know about two characters that competed in the finals game show, Scotty and Odelia. Though we don't know much about Scotty, there are many voice lines alluding to his glory days as a contestant, and he even has an achievement called Just Like Scotty, awarded for winning a round in any mode without being eliminated. But something doesn't feel right about Scotty. If you pay close attention to his voice lines, you'll notice how sassy, cold, and sometimes condescending he can be towards contestants and his fellow commentator, June. While that could be simply his personality, a message from CNS suggests otherwise. Seek the truth beyond the walls led us to discover another message hidden in Monaco, S. Lies. We know that Scotty has friendly ties with Volpe CEO Mackenzie Lapis and that he was trying to get a pre-release version of a product. CNS could be hinting that Scotty might have a bigger role in the grand scheme of things and not just a retired contestant now turned commentator. So there is definitely more to him that meets the eye. The other character is Odilia, better known as the Trickster and she was a popular contestant in the finals competing with the group called Shadow Flock. Though we don't know much about her either, what struck me as odd was her face. And I don't mean her physical attributes, but the fact that it's a wearable cosmetic within the game show. This could imply that virtual avatars are owned by Multico under the terms of use for the finals, if there are any or that Multico can at least acquire avatars from contestants once they retire. Now, we don't know if Odilia's face is based on the contestant's real self, or if they are still alive, or what kind of deal they had with Multico. But with everything we've established, it shouldn't surprise us if Multico actually resorts to mischievous actions both in the virtual and the real world to get what they want. It's lights out in the arena. From all of us here at the finals, thanks for watching. And we're out. Time for an Osboos Pro Juice. You actually drink those? Wouldn't want Sophia to hear you say that. Oh, she has enough on her plate with the recent hacks. Trust me. They're not hacks, June. They're glitches. Besides, Holto's not worried. They don't run the show. They just sponsor it. Someone put those messages in the system. Ah, uh, you worry too much. You keep telling yourself that, Scotty. The writing's on the wall. Literally. As you can see, the final story remains ambiguous and puzzling. 
but it's slowly revealing crucial overarching themes that could potentially shape a darker and more compelling narrative than what it's seen at the surface level. Between the sponsors, the in-game voice lines, and the hidden messages in the arenas and cosmetics, there are still plenty of threats to unfold. And while this is certainly not the first time we've seen a story that explores the nuances of hyper-capitalism and virtual reality, like Tron, Blade Runner, The Matrix, Ready Player One, and even Strange Days, I think Embark will go down a slightly different road, one that leans more towards a cryptic, enigmatic way of storytelling, bits and pieces that make us question the bigger picture, as we did in shows like Lost, Heroes or Westworld. And even though I still crave for a clearer sense of story, I've actually grown fond of simply having fun searching for clues, connecting ideas, and theorizing about the possibilities in the final world.